Thank you to Bitdefender for sponsoring a portion of this video. The iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max have been out now for around three and a half to four months. And in this video, I wanna go over my three month experience using the iPhone 14 Pro Max as my daily driver. You see, in the past like four or five years, I've had like a love-hate relationship with Apple. I feel like they do a lot of great things, brilliant things even. However, in the process of making these extraordinary things, they tend to backstep quite a bit. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into the video, beginning with the design of the iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max. The iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max have a design that is getting long in the tooth, in my opinion. I really am getting tired of seeing the same exact style iPhone year after year after year. If we look at the iPhone 11, that's pretty much where this entire new design started. Granted, yes, the iPhone 11 was more rounded on the sides, but if you look at the back of each phone, you'll probably have a hard time distinguishing the iPhone 11 from the iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max, especially if you look at the camera bump. The iPhone 14 Pro Max does have a larger camera bump than the iPhone 13 Pro Max, and the camera modules themselves are slightly bigger, and that's to accommodate larger sensors, which we'll talk about once we get into the camera portion. Now, if you're located in the US or you happen to have a US model iPhone, there is one design that I am really not a fan of, and that's the removal of the SIM card slot. Don't get me wrong, I get it. Esim is the future. It's easier than swapping out a regular SIM card because you can do it all on your phone, but carriers have to be on board and they have to make that process seamless. And unfortunately here in the US, that is just not happening. Like we are not there yet. And take it from me, someone that had to leave their current carrier and go to a different carrier just to activate their iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max. Now on the front, we no longer have a notch. Instead, we have a dynamic island. And this is one of those ingenious, brilliant moves by Apple. Rather than trying to hide a notch or try to make a notch smaller, they make the notch interactive in a part of the phone. And I gotta say, it works. I absolutely love it. I love how the notifications interact with the dynamic island. I love how when you create a timer, it just goes up into the dynamic island. Now, don't get me wrong, it would be better without it, but for the time being, this was a brilliant move on Apple. The iPhone 14 Pro and iPhone 14 Pro Max have significantly better durability versus the iPhone 13 series. And this is based on everyday use and wear and tear, not dropping the phone or trying to scratch it using different tools and things like that, but just pulling it in and out of my pocket and using the phone daily like a normal person would do. And I barely have any scratches on this phone. I still suggest putting some type of case on just for accidental drops. And I do suggest using a screen protector if you are prone to dropping your phone. Now, the great thing about iPhones and something that's really underrated is how many accessories, specifically screen protectors and cases are available for iPhones in all price ranges. So that's how you can protect the outside of your phone. But what about the software side? What about your computer at home? Well, that's where this video's sponsor comes in, Bitdefender. When it comes to cybersecurity, let's put this in a perspective that we can all relate to. Let's say your home is like your computer because it stores all of your personal belongings and information. You wouldn't leave your doors wide open just so anybody can walk into your house. Just like you wouldn't leave your computer available just so anybody can walk over and start using it. You keep your doors shut and locked just like most people keep their computers private using passwords, pens, and biometrics. Unfortunately, homes have other vulnerabilities. For instance, these windows right here. Now let's say each one of these windows represents a vulnerability on your computer. So this window represents emails. And this window represents social media platforms and messaging. This window over here represents website links. And this window over here represents Wi-Fi. Of course, to protect yourself, you could make sure that all of these windows are locked or that you don't click on suspicious links. However, you can easily slip up and forget to lock one window or open that one email. Once inside, malware and cyber threats can lay dormant. You won't catch these on your own. And it's like having an intruder in your house that you can't see or hear, but every time you do something vulnerable, like lay your wallet on the table, the intruder is there to copy your info. Now, imagine going years with this threat living with you and how much information has been stolen. 
So how do you prevent someone from getting into your home other than basic precautions like locking your windows and doors? Well, you get a trustworthy and reliable security system with 24 seven monitoring. So if you think about your computer, just like your home, you need to get an industry standard antivirus software. That way it can protect your computer. And that's why I recommend Bitdefender Total Security. It's a class leading antivirus software that does more than just protect your computer. It actually improves the performance. Unlike other antivirus software, Bitdefender is extremely lightweight, so it doesn't take up a lot of space and it optimizes the performance of your PC based off your usage, whereas other software can potentially slow down tasks and ultimately leave your PC crawling. Thanks to Bitdefender's vulnerability scanner, it will make sure your PC doesn't have any weak areas. My favorite features include the built-in VPN, which has been updated for 2023, giving even better performance, online threat prevention that can scan websites, letting you know if they're harmful before you click on them, and all of the built-in utilities, such as the one-click optimizer that improves system performance with one click. Currently, you can pick up Bitdefender's total security with a huge discount just by clicking on the link in the description. Even if you're not in the market currently for antivirus software, clicking on the link in the description helps show support to the channel and is greatly appreciated. Plus, just because you're not interested in it now doesn't mean you won't be later, and these prices are excellent. Another thing that Apple got right with the iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max is the content consumption experience. It's still the same 6.7 inch display. And if you looked at the display and you looked at the iPhone 13 Pro and 13 Pro Max display side by side, you probably couldn't notice a difference at first glance. However, if you take these phones outside under direct sunlight, you will most certainly notice the difference. The iPhone 14 Pro Max can go all the way up to 2000 nits for its peak brightness, whereas the iPhone 13 Pro Max caps out at 1200. It makes using the phone outside much easier, and it's also great for viewing HDR content. The iPhone 14 Pro Max has a 120 hertz LTPO display, just like the iPhone 13 Pro Max. The difference is, is on the lower end. The iPhone 13 Pro Max goes all the way down to 10 hertz, whereas the 14 Pro Max can go all the way down to one hertz, making it better for battery life, which it definitely needs. And we'll talk more about that once we get the battery. All in all, the display on the iPhone 14 Pro Max is incredible. And in my opinion, it's the best display on any smartphone to date. However, the display is just part of the equation when it comes to content consumption. The other part is the speakers. And I'm happy to say the iPhone 14 Pro Max has incredible speakers. Just listen for yourself. Moving on to the software side of things. My experience with iOS 16 has been hit or miss. I do appreciate a lot of the new features. So let me just give you a quick rundown of what my favorite features are, and then I'm gonna give you my problems with iOS 16. So first and foremost, I absolutely love the fact that we now have the battery percentage, it's back, so you can enable it inside of the battery settings, and now you can have an actual percentage of your battery versus just the battery indicator. Love that. I also really like the new haptic feedback that you get when using the keyboard. You can enable this in the settings. And I know this isn't new, it's been around forever on Android, but the iPhone has one of the best haptic engines in the game. And there's just something really pleasing about that subtle vibration that you get. It just feels really good. The third feature that I wanna talk about is the ability to unsend a text message or edit a text message after you send it. I use it all the time and I'm so happy it's part of iOS 16. Now these are my top three favorite features, ones that I use daily. So there's a lot going on with the software and I think that Apple has done a pretty good job. With all that being said, everything isn't sunshine and roses over here. First and foremost, while I greatly appreciate the ability to add widgets to the lock screen, I do feel like the entire process is a little cumbersome and it could be confusing to people not used to the iPhone. In fact, if you're not used to the Apple Watch, it could be confusing because the layout is very similar to Watch OS, which I'm not really a fan of, but that's just my personal opinion. And while yes, we do have widget support, it is extremely limited and they're very small. While Apple is giving you a little bit more flexibility, it's still very limited and tightly controlled. But I guess baby steps until we actually get what we want. The next issue that I have isn't specific to iOS 16, and that has to do with the app library. I love the idea of it. I love the simplicity of it. And I love the fact that it automatically categorizes your apps for you so you don't have to do it. However, it messes up quite a bit. 
And Apple should allow you to go in and tweak it and move apps around. That way you can actually categorize them the way they should be. The last issue I wanna talk about when it comes to iOS 16 is the random glitches and freezes and crashes that I experience. I know that the last update that Apple pushed out for iOS 16 did iron out most of the bugs associated with the actual software itself. However, I'm noticing several issues in third-party apps, which I don't know it has to do with the app developer or if it's iOS 16 or the way the two talk to each other. I'm not sure. I just know that the experience isn't as seamless and as fluid as I would like coming from a company like Apple that controls the hardware, the software, and has a very tight grip on their app store. Chances are it'll get fixed and then iOS 17 will come out and we'll be right back in the same boat. So in case you haven't been able to tell the theme of this video, it's basically two steps forward, one step backwards. The same thing can be said about the performance of this phone. The A16 Bionic incredible processor very powerful. This phone is great for gaming. It's great for uh, photo editing. It's great for video editing. Even doing some audio editing on this phone has been fantastic. All of the AI features centered around this new chipset, beautiful. I love this phone, but this phone will overheat for zero reason. I could be watching a YouTube video in 1080p inside under an AC vent and the back of the phone will get really hot. The screen will dim and it overheats. I'll even notice performance issues. I could be typing on the keyboard and there's lag. And I know this is probably software related, but the way that it interacts with the hardware makes me feel like I'm using an inferior phone. And this also translates into battery life. So check it out. The iPhone 14 Pro Max has a smaller battery than the iPhone 13 Pro Max, but the difference is negligible. It's like what, 20 or 30 million hours? It's honestly not that much of a difference whatsoever. However, the iPhone 14 Pro Max has a more efficient processor with the A16 Bionic versus the A15. It also has a better display being able to refresh all the way down to one hertz. And these two features alone make this phone more efficient. It's gonna be better with battery management. Software also plays an important factor here. And iOS 16, in my personal opinion, has gotten worse and worse with battery life with each update. When I first got this phone, battery life was incredible. But as of today, I'm getting better battery life on my Galaxy S22 Ultra. It is a very inconsistent phone when it comes to battery life because I was able to average anywhere between nine, 10 to 11 hours of screen on time when I first got this phone, even after the first update. But now I'm barely getting seven. For instance, I've been on Wi-Fi all day. It's 1.55 PM and I am at 59%. I took this phone off of the charger at about 7.30. And if I go into the settings and take a look at my battery health, we're still at 100%, so that's definitely good and a major improvement from last year. However, the battery life itself is just not very good. Okay, so let's end things with the cameras on the iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max. On the back, we have two new cameras. We have a new ultra wide and we have a new wide. Let's begin with the new standard or wide camera. It's a new 48 megapixel sensor. And while that may not seem too impressive on paper, the size of the sensor is what matters. And this sensor has increased quite a bit since the iPhone 13 Pro Max, and it's really good. It lets in more light, it produces a sharper image, more detail, more colors, and overall, it's just a better sensor. Thanks to this new sensor, we also have a two times telephoto option. So no longer are we stuck with 1X and 3X, there is an in-between. It is a digital crop on the sensor, but AI and Apple's magic is able to make the image look really good. In certain circumstances, it actually looks just as good as the 3X telephoto, especially in good lighting, so I'm pretty impressed. We also have a true 24 millimeter focal length, which is something that we typically don't see on other smartphones. The last thing I wanna talk about when it comes to this new sensor is the ability to capture 48 megapixel photos. You can only do this if you enable Pro Raw. If you don't enable Pro Raw, you're gonna get left with a 12 megapixel shot. Granted, it's gonna look great because it's a bin shot. So basically it's going to capture a 48 megapixel photo and then compress it to 12 megapixel, but it does this all behind the scenes in camera. And then your output is just 12 megapixel. Again, most people are gonna be completely fine with this. But if you want the ability to crop in on your photo, whether you're doing some reframing or trying to turn one photo into two, you're gonna to want to turn on Pro Raw to take advantage of the full 48 megapixels. The other new camera on the back is the ultra wide. 
Granted, I wouldn't blame you for thinking that this is the exact same camera as the iPhone 13 Pro Max. The difference is very slight. It's still the same 12 megapixel resolution. However, the sensor size has increased slightly, giving you all the benefits of a larger sensor, such as better low light video, better low light photos. It's just a little bit better than last year. Now, when it comes to the 3X telephoto, it's the exact same camera that's on the iPhone 13 Pro and 13 Pro Max, which is not a bad thing. There are minor differences, but it all comes down to processing, such as colors, dynamic range, and sharpness. All in all, the photos are great, but still not the best. There's a lot of inconsistencies with white balance and HDR. Sometimes for no reason, it will overexpose the background. Portrait mode is also hit or miss, but when it hits, the pictures do come out incredible. It's a very capable camera and I enjoy using it, but the app could use a major upgrade. A white balance lock or adjustment slider like the Pixel series has would be great. In fact, if we're going to mention white balance, Apple really needs to add a real pro mode inside of the camera app, especially when Pro Raw is so good and their stock photo editor is also quite capable. Now on the front side of the phone, we have a brand new selfie camera. Again, I wouldn't blame you for thinking that this is exactly the same camera as the iPhone 13 Pro and 13 Pro Max, because again, on paper, they look very similar, but it does have a brighter aperture, giving you better low light video and low light photos. And it's gonna give you a more shallow depth of field, meaning that you're gonna get better bokeh when taking a selfie and not using portrait mode. But the most important upgrade on the selfie camera is the inclusion of autofocus. It really does improve the quality of the front-facing camera by ensuring you're in focus, whether you're capturing a photo or recording a video. I'm just confused on why this is considered a feature versus a standard. I feel like this should be implemented on all selfie cameras across the board. So that's the photo side of things. Now let's talk about the video side of things because Apple has added a few things in this area, making the experience even better. And I gotta say, the experience on the iPhone when it comes to recording video was already the best. And now they've just taken things even further. For starters, the stabilization, like the default stock stabilization is so good. They have really improved it. They've dialed in the algorithm and it just, it just performs extremely well. But in the rare case, you need even more stabilization. We now have a new action mode, which is a digital stabilization to the next level. It's similar to super steady on the galaxy series or how action cameras like GoPro and Insta360 use a digital form of stabilization to smooth out their footage. It's pretty much the same as that, but now we have it on the iPhone. The disadvantages of using action mode come down to frame rate and resolution limitations. So you can only record in 1080p and you're limited to just a couple different frame rates. But in any case, if you need that silky smooth, ridiculously stable footage, you now have the option on your iPhone. Cinematic mode has also been updated. And while it's still a little wonky with subject detection, when it hits, it looks really good. And it now supports 4K up to 30 frames per second with HDR. So the quality is there. They just really need to dial in that subject detection and then we'll be in business. So just like with photo mode, I really feel like Apple needs to add a pro mode for video. We have all these amazing features when it comes to video capture. We have great autofocus. We have ProRes video. We have a good selection of lenses, incredibly versatile and powerful cameras, but no option to really dial in our own settings. And that is what the camera as a whole is missing. We need pro mode for video and for photo. But ultimately, I gotta say, when it comes to video capture and video creation, the iPhone is still the king, in my opinion. Okay, so let's wrap this up. Typically, I always regret going with the larger phone, but in this case, I'm very happy. And that's because I got the smaller phone out of my system last year. I hated the battery life, loved the size, but just couldn't deal with having to charge my phone in the middle of the day. However, the battery benefits of this phone are just not what I thought they were going to be, or at least not what they were initially. So that's been my biggest gripe about the 14 Pro Max. Outside of that, I can deal with a few software bugs here and there. I know those are gonna get straightened out. The camera performance, while it is hit or miss and inconsistent, I know they'll end up fixing that as well. And this is a great phone. I just, um, I have a few gripes. And it's like I said, Apple tends to take two steps forward and one step backwards. And the iPhone 14 Pro Max, 